Welcome. On behalf of the Board of Trustees of the Exploratorium and the entire institution, I welcome each and every one of you to the CANBAR Forum. Uh, the Exploratorium is, of course, so much more than a museum, but we've long described ourselves as a museum of science, art, and human perception. We are also, according to TripAdvisor and the thousands of uh, reviews that happened there, ranked the number one museum in San Francisco. And thank you. Uh, and, uh, you know, just in 2018, the New York Times uh, ranked us near the very top of the 10 coolest museums in the world. So welcome, you are among the 10 coolest people <laughs> in the world too. All right, um, we are very delighted to host, uh, as we do periodically, th this series. We call it Truth or Consequences, the Misperceptions of Human Perception. So thank you for joining us today. I think you're gonna have a good time. I am Chris Flink, the executive director of this phenomenal institution. Uh, but it's not 2018 anymore, it's 2019, and this is the first of the speaker series in this new year of 2019, which also happens to be a very special year for the Exploratorium. Do you, yes, 50, says the man in the back. You're right, this is our golden anniversary. So you are here for the first golden anniversary edition of Truth or Consequences, The Misperceptions of Human Perception. Before I introduce uh, today's illustrious guest, as you've noticed on the screen, there's some uh, things going by that will give you a bit of a feel for this series. So I'm gonna highlight um, what we started in 2016 as a, a, a speaker series meant to encourage people to think for themselves, right? Which is a big part of how, how we approach the world. And to uh, help them do so, uh, we brought in some really bright minds. Uh, our inaugural speaker was none other than Sir Michael Moritz, one of the most celebrated and greatest venture capitalists of our time, who spoke with us about the intersection of investment and human perception of risk. Another speaker was Michael Lewis, the uh, well-known and best-selling author who discussed the famous and unlikely friendship between psychologists Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman that shifted the way we understand human decision-making. Elizabeth Loftus, acclaimed psychologist and memory expert, showed us that our own memories are not as reliable as we may think and that we can, they can even be edited by ourselves and by others around us. That's not enough. We not long ago had Annie Duke, World Series of Poker champion, who talked to us about the connections between making million dollar bets with all the chips and regular everyday decision making. But I think it's time now to introduce today's special speaker. Tonight we are lucky to be joined by Golan Levin. Uh, he is a leader in the international world of media art. He uses creative twists to digital technologies to highlight our relationship with machines and make visible our ways of interacting with each other. Any less than all these other great accolades I could mention about Golan is the fact that he was a 2017 Exploratorium Osher Fellow. Our Osher Fellow program brings specialists from across disciplines as thinkers in residence to inspire and inform the Exploratorium community. He also created the interactive music composition artwork Scrapple, which many of you were just playing with uh, moments ago. Uh, Golan, when he is not here at the Exploratorium, which unfortunately is more than I would like, he is uh, also the director of the Frank Ratchi Studio for Creative Inquiry at Carnegie Mellon and a professor of art. He works as an educator, a creator, and a collaborator at the highest level. Tonight, we are grateful to have Golan share his unique understanding and perspective into the state of technology's role in art. Uh, as all of you, I think, probably know, the Exploratorium has always celebrated science and art, or uh, art and STEM, as complementary ways of exploring the world around you, as an uh, important pairing of ways to inquire and ask questions about the world. And, uh, Therefore, it feels so natural to have Golan here and here talking with you tonight. Uh, he's gonna give us a close up on how artificial intelligence is being used to make art and how that use highlights the whimsical and fallible nature of human perception. I wanna thank each of you in the audience for supporting the Exploratorium in its golden anniversary year. In fact, turn to someone next to you. Turn to someone next to you, give them a high five. Give them a little high five, yeah. You guys are fantastic. We are very grateful for each and every one of you. 
and maybe with that same hand or and using the other one, you could join me in a uproarious round of applause for our guest, Golan Levin. Hello. Hi, everyone. Ah, rockin'. Uh, thank you so much. I am hugely honored to be here. Uh, this is literally my favorite place on earth. So, no, no, it is. Like, I'm, I'm very excited. I brought the whole family. The kids are feral, spending several days here. It's great. Sorry, they, they say free range. That's right. Um, <coughs> um, I am so happy to be here. Um, I have a new talk. Uh, I don't know how long it is, but I'll try and um, not knock you out too much. Um, but uh, tonight's a sort of a rollicking journey, uh, showing some of my own work, uh, but also a lot of work by other people, um, and thinking about um, artificial intelligence, which of course is in the air, and sort of this big transformative thing that's happening now. Um, my talk is going to be mostly focused on art, um, and uh, the way that artificial intelligence is sort of playing into that, or machine learning is playing into that. There's a lot of ways in which um, artificial intelligence is affecting our lives in comprehensive senses, and um, I, I can only barely play someone on TV who, who sort of can talk about like machine learning and ethics, for example. There are much better people than I. Um, but all of this sort of does serve, sort of it's all adjacent. Um, so tonight, um, the talk was billed as truth or consequences. I'm not sure I'm going to talk about either, really. Um, but um, I am going to discuss some connections between how uh, new media artists and computer artists are working now, and especially those working with machine learning, and uh, some connections between the way we're working now and the way we worked in the past. Um, uh, so, you know, I assume that, you know, if you're here tonight, it's because you're a devoted fan of the Exploratorium, as I am, and a lot of the things I'll be showing tonight are actually live demonstrations, um, uh, all of which are online. So you can go home and try them yourself, and if I've really done my job, I'm going to ruin your weekend, because you're going to be like, you're going to be clicking on these things because they're so fascinating. I, I think one of the things that, that, that characterizes the sort of live demonstrations I'll be showing you uh, is that they have a lot of exploratoriumness. Uh, and what I mean by that is that, that they have a lot of explanatory power um, while also being really engaging, open-ended, uh, frankly fun, uh, hands-on systems for creative play. So a lot of the things I'll be showing you tonight are, are, are online and you can kind of learn about um, machine learning and, and image processing, for example, or the arts uh, from them. <coughs> I'm going to begin with a tiny story, though. Uh, there's um, a Twitter bot called uh, Pick Desk Bot, and uh, it's a, a, a bot on Twitter that's sort of constantly publishing um, its interpretation of images. And it selects images randomly off some gigantic database, and it sends them to something called Microsoft Cognitive Services, which is just Microsoft's particular sort of artificial intelligence system. And it, it asks Microsoft to describe what it sees. And uh, the, the tweet, which is pinned at the very top of this uh, uh, Twitter bot, is this, uh, it, is what Microsoft returned when it showed it this image here, and it said a dinosaur on top of a surfboard. Um, and I, I think that if you were depending on Microsoft to give you a description of what your camera was seeing, if you were, let's say, vision impaired, okay, that this would be considered a bad result, <laughs> perhaps, perhaps even a dangerous, dangerously bad result. Um, but to me, it's really quite interesting, and, and I want to um, sort of talk about the way in which this kind of quality of serendipity that this uh, picture has is sort of exactly what I want to get at with uh, my work and which a lot of other artists who are using artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence and machine learning want to get at with their work. So speaking of serendipity, let's, let's talk about cybernetic serendipity, um, <coughs> which um, how many of you are familiar with this? Are you familiar? Oh, great. So uh, if you know, uh, this was basically the first exhibition, yeah, it was basically the first exhibition of computer art okay, in 1968. Speaking of computer art, right? Computer art, it's older than acrylic paint. All right, so <laughs> true fact. Uh, that, uh, so this is this legendary exhibition, the very first uh, exhi group exhibition of computer art, organized by a woman named Yasha Reichart uh, in 1968. Uh, she's a Polish-born Holocaust survivor who uh, is still alive, and um, uh, organized this exhibition in, at the London Institute for Contemporary Art, the third place and last place that it traveled to uh, was here at the Exploratorium in 1969. Um, and uh, I'm gonna, I, I submit to you that the computer as a tool for the production of serendipity has been an abiding theme in computational culture for the past 50 years. And in my line of work, the, the whimsical like dinosaur on top of a surfboard that you just saw is not a faulty recognition, but in fact a poetic endpoint uh, that, that has this quality of serendipity. Um, so 
Uh, many of the projects that I'm going to be showing you tonight are from this original exhibition, Cybernetic Serendipity, and I'm going to kind of connect them in a kind of a strain or a thread to current contemporary computer artwork that's being done by folks 50 years later, uh, you know, in, in my generation and younger. Uh, so uh, let's see, it's as you, just a, a word about artificial intelligence, right? As you know, it's, it's been said that uh, once AI is working, it's no longer AI, it's just engineering. Um, and from my perspective as an artist and educator, especially in high-tech contexts like my university, I teach at Carnegie Mellon, it often seems that everything has to be shoehorned into something productive. Um, you know, my, my students who are artists and they're working with machine learning, they often get asked, well, what's the, what's the use of that? What's the, how can that, you know, make money somehow? How can that be a product? Uh, and in my opinion, making something for productivity is precisely the very force that warps AI into engineering. And I think about people by contrast, right? True intelligence is not cultivated for mundane tasks. Um, as a human, I may or may not recognize an alien intelligence, but I know what it isn't, and that's the automation of a mundane task. So if, some, if someone or something makes me question what I think I know, that's a sign of their intelligence. And aspirationally, I believe that the job of AI is to present serendipity then, surprise, wonder, and magic. That's the real job, not necessarily the mundane <coughs> Uh, automation that we think about. Um, and so, uh, and yet what, when we see this dinosaur on a skateboard, it's presenting a, to us this weird mind, right? This weird alternative mind that the computer has. And that's what, what, what many artists now are, are interested in exploring. Um, maybe a bit more context. Uh, I'll be focusing on the arts in this talk, as I mentioned, showing projects by myself, uh, my students, uh, my friends, my peers. Um, these projects were made by tiny teams of collaborators, sometimes just single individuals, often building on open source code uh, in unexpected ways. And I'll be focusing on so-called AI techniques such as neural nets, but recognizing that such technologies were originally developed for military purposes, as so many technologies are. It, these creators, myself included, uh, we could describe ourselves as bottom feeders on military technology or, or uh, bottom feeders on surveillance tech. This way of working it has a long and, and complicated and common history in computer art. Um, you know, the very first computer artists who were in cybernetic serendipity uh, were often trying to knock on the doors of these research labs to get access to these sort of military computers uh, because they were the only computers around, right? The, first, the first computers were not made for the arts, they were made for, for uh, you know, business and military purposes. Uh, and in the words of Bruce Sterling, uh, the goal of my, you know, me and other artists like me is, is, you know, to drag the most crabbed and arcane debris of a tech revolution into some realm of artistic expression. So let's get there. Um, I'm going to begin with kind of a monstrous digression, uh, actually, from the main body of my talk. I want to show you kind of an example of a project that I've made. Um, it, it does happen to use machine learning, but that's not sort of its focus. I wouldn't call the project about machine learning. It's just sort of, sort of something that plays into how, it's, how it works. Um, and it's a, it's a project which took me 10 years to make, um, concerned with hands, our hands and culture, in our imaginations, um, and in our nightmares. Uh, and it uses machine learning, but that's, again, not, not sort of the point. Um, uh, and I, in this project, I'm seeking to sort of unify the whimsical and playful with the uncanny and the dreamlike, the alien with the cartoon. And in this project that I'll show you, I'm kind of leading a big, a big surprise, th uh, this, this hands, the means by which we sort of perform actions in the world, become a proxy for kind of a new dislocated identity and a dislocated self. When we want to know what's real, uh, we look at our hands. You know, am I ha really, is this really happening to me? Uh, a confirmation, a grounding. Here's Apocalypse Now. You know, here's Neo sort of dissolving into the matrix. Uh, you know, we look at our hands and say, is this really happening to me? And <coughs> this, uh, you know, using our hands to know what is real has been with us for a long time. Uh, it may even explain, for example, the discovery of x-rays by William Rentgen in 1895. Um, uh, you know, three days before Christmas, he brought his wife into his laboratory and they emerged with a photograph of the bones in her hand. This is the very first x-ray. Uh, the Würzburg Physical Medical Society uh, was the first to hear of the new rays that could penetrate the body and photograph its bones. Uh, Rentgen delivered the news on the 28th of December, 1895, and uh, it was relayed to the Berlin Physical Society on the 4th of January. The next day, the Vienna Press carried the news and the day following, word of his discovery of x-rays traveled all around the world. Um, the news of this amazing discovery, this new way of seeing the world, traveled incredibly quickly. And um, soon experimental, experimentalists all over the world were conducting similar experiments. Look at their hands. Um, if you were a researcher in 1896, you were pretty much in the business of staring at your hands. 
<laughs> and it really is amazing how closely identified the x-ray was with the hand. Um, this is a device called a fluoroscope. It would make an amazing uh, exploratorium exhibit if it weren't shooting you in the face with x-rays. Um, <laughs> it's basically, it's a real-time, you know, x-ray of your hand. Uh, it's kind of like a real-time memento mori. Uh, you can, you know, and early fluoroscope operators would make sure their machines were warmed up by checking to see if their finger bones appeared in the scope, right? So this is sort of like the media art entertainment of 1896. Um, Edison uh, is credited with designing and producing the first commercially available fluoroscopes. Uh, and uh, so the um, fundamental design of his fluoroscope is still in use today despite the fact that he himself abandoned the project after nearly losing his own eyesight and seriously injuring his assistant, Clarence Daly. That's this guy on the left. Daly had made himself an enthusiastic human guinea pig for fluoroscopy and in the process had been exposed to a poisonous dose of radiation, later died of injuries related to his exposure. And in 1903, a, a very shaken Thomas Edison said, don't talk to me about x-rays, I'm afraid of them. Um, but uh, before he, he gave up his, uh, his demonstrations, uh, he was giving sort of public uh, uh, views. Public fascination with x-rays was so great uh, that he was giving public demonstrations as much to present the science as to impress the public with his inventions. And uh, became a, car a parlor trick. Uh, an amusement. Fluoroscopy, which is this x-ray viewer you see here, uh, permitted a kind of real-time uh, view of death, right? You could see your bones. You could see what happens. Um, and interestingly, the same manufacturers who were making equipment for the laboratories the, and for medicine and for scientific research were also the same manufacturers producing x-ray equipment for seances. So there's this French company, uh, Radi Gay, and then over here they're sort of making this equipment for the lab, and on the right uh, they have these seances where um, they would bathe the room in x-rays and then they'd have like leaded glass that would glow um, and uh, you know sort of people would have these sort of mystical experiences and the result was a sort of all too real phantasmagoria <laughs> in, in 1899 uh, x-ray parties were all the rage um, <coughs> fairgrounds purchased equipment from laboratories social gatherings all over Paris were brightened with luminous apparitions uh, with a crook's tube hidden behind a black curtain magicians would make glasses porcelain and women's jewelry fluoresce uh, to the amazement of guests. Uh, many theaters, department stores, museums, and fairgrounds soon offered a demonstration under 10 cents. There again is the hand. And staring at your hand became an icon for the x-ray. In the hundreds of patents that followed on Rentgen's discovery, the hand was always featured. Um, and here we can see it in cigarette cards. These were small collectible cards that came in the back of pa uh, cigarette packs that featured celebrities, pictures of flowers, topics of popular interest like x-rays. And in effect, if not intention, people were building inspection stations for their hands. And this lasted well until my childhood uh, in the 20th century. Um, so I'm very interested in hands, and, and this is one example of that. Um, and uh, uh, I, I'm fascinated particularly by the possibility of hands which have a certain kind of autonomy. Uh, you know, hands which are different and make us think differently about ourselves, not just necessarily because of their form, but in their, in their ability to, to act on their own. Um, perhaps you're familiar with uh, Kubrick's Dr. Strangelove, who suffers from a very real condition uh, called alien hand syndrome. Uh, it's an unusual but factually real neurological disorder, known as, also known as anarchic hand, in which this one of the sufferer's hands seems to take on a mind of its own. And there are other really uh, interesting conditions as well. You may know about phantom limb syndrome, which uh, people who, have, who are missing a limb uh, uh, sometimes feel. It's, it's the sensation that an amputated limb uh, is still there attached to the body. Uh, interestingly, the missing limb often feels shorter and may feel as if it is in a distorted and painful position. Um, uh, changes in the position of the phantom limb are common and they do not necessarily follow a correct anatomical posture. People can feel like their knees are bending backwards in strange ways. And this stuff gets even weirder. Um, uh, in, in 2009, two researchers carried out an experiment in which they encouraged arm amputees to use visual imagery to contort their phantom limbs into impossible configurations. Uh, and f uh, many subjects were able to do this. Um, so uh, this is the project that I made. It's called the Augmented Hand Series. I created it with Chris Segrew and, and Kyle McDonald. Um, and in the words of one seven-year-old, it's a box. You put your hand into it, you get an extra finger. Um, uh, so there are things we don't understand about ourselves. Uh, the confusing thing of ownership of a body is one. And uh, seeing those things understood and subverted by machines is uncanny and kind of what I'm trying to get at with some of my work. Um, uh, it actually does a lot of different kinds of transformations. Um, uh, there, here's some of them. Uh, this sort of defamiliarization, <laughs> some really strange sounds coming from the crowd. <laughs> Where do you see it move live? Uh, this sort of defamiliarization is a core strategy in the arts, right? To see our hands thus transformed is to experience our most familiar extensions made unfamiliar. 
um, refracted in giddy, new, and peculiar ways. Um, uh, critically, this project's uh, transformations operate within the logical space of the hand itself, which is to say the artwork performs hand-aware visualizations that understand something about and alter the deep structure of how the hand appears. Um, furthermore, the artwork not only alters the appearance of the hand, but also its behavior as well, so the hand can behave autonomously. Um, and so here you can get kind of a glimpse of what it looks like a little bit behind the scenes, in this case where it's, it's taking a hand, and in this case subtracting a finger. Um, in, in many important ways, I think you already understand how this project works. It, with the digital body, right, we can copy and paste, as we have always done. Right? So um, in this case, on the right-hand side, we're copying and pasting, adding a thumb. Um, so here's a brief demo. Um, I want to particularly bring your attention to this moment when uh, these two children sort of exhibit suspended disbelief. Uh, especially as we get older, like, you know, we can put some serious distance between ourselves and the experience of being a child. Um, this helps us focus on things like productivity and making productive things. But, but weirding reality shortens that distance. So look at this kid at this moment. He sort of like ducks in there, looks underneath. I'll show you. This kid here, he looks inside. And this, this other kid as well feels compelled to like, is this, is this really happening? And uh, it, when that happens, like, that's to me my, my understanding. Like, I, I know that I've, success, you know, I've succeeded with the project. Um, when I've been able to sort of fool someone to that extent that they have to kind of look in there uh, to see if this is really happening to them. Um, that's, the, that's, that's the payoff. I'll take questions on anything you've seen so far. <laughs> um, you said that the computer had kind of a weird mind. An apparent mind, yeah, sure. Yeah? And I think that maybe it's the person that's using the computer, like the questions they form, that <laughs> uses its structure to come up with something odd and poetic. Yeah. And not necessarily that the computer has a mind that can um, make a po make choose a poetic, odd thing. I, I agree. <laughs> I, I no, I agree. I actually, I <coughs> I pulled one slide, which is. Um, this fantastic drawing of how an observer and the observed are kind of coextensive, um, and how, and how, um, in the case of computers that are now acting in ways that sort of seem to have intent, um, that there's a uh, a way in which we sort of anthropomorphize the computer, not visually like a character with cute eyes, but sort of will as a will that has a mind, and that that this is something we impute to the machine, um, and so our 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 perception of the computer becomes something that we, we sort of, are the, the nearest terms we have for it is that it's acting with a, with a mind. Um, I agree. I don't, I don't, I don't think they're, they're, that, that they're intelligent, <coughs> um, which is, I think, a, a sensitive point for people who are, and, I, and I'm, I'm one of them, I, I, I don't think these machines are actually intelligent. But they're, the way that they behave is so uncanny in terms of it's the way that they seem to understand some things and sort of obliviously don't understand others um, reveals what, I, what we could only kind of describe as a mind-like thing that, um, you know, depends a lot on, on our perception. Um, and so much of what we're putting into the computer now uh, is built on our own perception and the, the way that we perceive things. So it's not a surprise when we sort of say, well, we perceive things a certain way, I'm going to tell the machine that we perceive things a certain way, and when the machine sort of perceives it back to us that way or with some small changes that we think are uncanny, we sort of say it has a mind. Uh, this will become, I think, clear in, in the talk as well, where there's a bunch of, of ways in which um, the mind, for, back of a, for lack of a better word, that we sort of impute to the machine uh, sort of reveals this, the kind of failure points, um, uh, both in how we train it or how we understand it or what we think it's doing. Um, I think in the, the case of the arts, uh, the case that I'll make in the work to follow is that the machine itself is not the artist, but rather the artist who programs the machine is the artist. Um, and um, we are now in this place where we're, we're, we're programming computers, or we're programming machines, um, in ways that um, uh, we're, now, we're no longer controlling very simple geometric primitives like we used to in the cybernetic serendipity days, but that we're actually controlling machines that are capable of higher order perceptions 
right? Analogous to some of the kinds of ways we can perceive things. Computers can like find faces, you know, and so forth. Uh, and that in so doing, in manipulating machines that are able to find faces and eyes and you know bodies and cats and dogs, that um, that uh, it gets real weird. And the, the possibilities for the arts are really interesting. So that, that's kind of where where I'll be. Uh, it's actually a, a natural breaking point. I wanted to begin uh, a presentation now about uh, interpolation, um, which is this uh, kind of abiding topic uh, concern that we'll see going all the way back to cybernetic serendipity. Uh, but is still with us today. So I want to talk about interpolation, or sort of visualizing intermediate states of a transformation. I'll wax poetic for a moment and just say that we're, we're in one of the world's finest museums of wonder. And it's appropriate then to start with nature. Uh, who cannot but wonder at natural transformations? The mysterious metamorphosis of a caterpillar, for example, which creates a chrysalis, uh, which in turn uh, and in, in which, in which right, it privately and away from our eyes turns into a butterfly. <coughs> Transformation is not just a natural wonder, but often a sign of the supernatural. Uh, Jesus' first miracle is one of transmutation. All right? In John 2, we learn that he delivers a sign of his glory at the wedding at Cana, specifically by turning water into wine, uh, although no further details are given. Right? Just, just, okay. Um, and uh, the thing is, it's not enough, I think, for us to know that a transformation has occurred. We yearn, I think, as creative observers to see how this transformation takes place, step by step, to understand its mysterious details. We want to see some intermediate stages, to see inside the pupa for epistemic proof, as in this political cartoon of 1831 by Charles Philippon, which illustrates the progressive degradation of the effectiveness of the king's rule as he turns into a pear. <laughs> you know, whether producing still image sequences or animations, the computer is the ideal tool for visualizing these in-between states of form. How else could one produce the covers of Animorphs, a popular series of books, appropriately enough written for tweens, who are themselves grappling with wild and frustrating changes to their bodies? You know, here, a boy who turns into a horse, a girl who turns into a starfish, or perhaps the other, right, other way around, um, puberty, right? Um, when used with pixel-based images, this technique of transformation is called morphing. The first technology for which was developed by uh, Nancy Burson when she was an artist in residence at MIT in the early 1980s. Her software was face-aware, with representations for hand-coded landmarks like eyes and noses, and the ability to produce weighted blends between aligned images. For Nancy Burson, producing the transitional states between specific examples was an instrument for understanding and deconstructing entire categories, in this case shown here, of female beauties from, from the 1950s and from the 1970s. So on the left, an average of Betty Davis, Audrey Hepburn, Grace Kelly. On the right, an average uh, of Jane Fonda, Jacqueline Bisset, Diane Keaton, and so on. Um, so in my next slides, I thought it would be nice to consider the earliest history of sort of visual interpolation on the computer. Some of the earliest computed transformations study the relationship of form to randomness and explore the progressive dissolution or constitution of a single form due to entropy. Here, for example, is Chaos to Order, a plotter drawing made in 1967 by Chuck Suri and James Schaefer. The scan is from the 1968 uh, Cybernetic Serendipity Catalog. Um, <coughs> so each line in the hummingbird kind of comes apart or comes back together again. Uh, in this project called Lady Quark by Manfred Moore from 1972, it's a series of nine squares that also uses interpolation to forge a path from chaos to order. Uh, each square is progressively transformed over the course of 23 iterations into a randomized crinkly polygon. Uh, two other works shown in cybernetic serendipity consider the relationship and contrast of, of two forms without the influence of randomness, in this case. In the 1968 Return to Square by Masao Komura and Kunio Yamanaka, uh, they were members of uh, Jap Japan's computer technique group. Uh, the ideal form of the square is metamorphosed into the organic profile of a woman and then back to a square. Several versions of the work exist, including versions with exponential and linear transform interpolation. And this one's also from Cybernetic Serendipity. Um, Chuck Suri again in 1967 uh, created Aging Process a drawing rendered on a drum plotter by an IBM 7094. It's an attempt to see an evolution that happens to all of us. 
a person changing from young to old. But it fails to work, as one might naively expect. The project is full of glitches because the marks are not well parameterized. And I think that's an important um, maybe hinge point for us to think about. What would it mean for those marks to be parameterized well? Well, it would mean that like an eyebrow in one image is also an eyebrow in the destination image. And the, eye, the, you know, the nose line in the first image, the source image, would also be the nose line in the destination image. But instead, they're not ordered that way, and so the transformation sort of falls apart. Um, it, he, you know, he writes that the face of a girl turns gradually into that of an old woman, but really, I wouldn't call that gradual. That seems quite, <laughs> quite alarming. You know, I guess in your 50s, you just <laughs> the probability field. Uh, <coughs> I think the height of puzzling transformations may be Masao Kimura's 1968 "Running Cola is Africa," a well-known computer artwork, also from cybernetic serendipity. And I, I know it must be possible to find a meaning or story here. The artist is still alive. I contacted him and I asked him why he selected these specific shapes, but I did not get an answer. Um, but again, this kind of this, this obsession with sort of transforming one thing to another, maybe the arbitrariness was the point. Um, the computer really comes into its own when we ask it to show the intermediate states in otherwise impossible or unknowable transitions between forms that we know well. This lovely computer artwork is uh, not that well known, actually, called Fruit Salad by Goose Cranin and Adrian Hain from 1970. At the four corners are a platonic apple, lemon, orange, and chestnut. I guess for argument's sake, it's a fruit. Uh, but inside the square, the computer has produced these uncanny mixtures. So interpolating between well-parameterized forms is easy when the artist has created those parameters. Um, this approach is at an apex in a project like Jason Salabon's 2009 Still Life, in which a constantly evolving skull moves between and through different geometric mixtures of bear, human, baboon, and boar forms. Um, by the way, this is sped up 500 times. When you actually see the project, it's uh, kind of like a painting that's evolving too slowly to notice. Um, but here, it's exactly that case where the sort of the line, if you will, around the eye is, is the same in every sort of skull, bear, human, boar. Um, it's just slowly moving from one to the other. <coughs> um, in the case of machine learning, as we'll see again a couple times in this talk, the parameters of forms aren't directly specified by an artist, but they're rather indirectly inferred by the artist's learning systems. So generative models capture properties of images in a multidimensional representation called a latent space. And we can sample the latent space to create novel images. And in a project I'm going to show you my first sort of demonstration uh, called Space Sheet, uh, Brian Lowe and Tom White create a sort of spreadsheet-like interface for exploring the latent space between images. So let's see if this works. I'm going to hit escape, and I'm going to go right over here. Oh, that's interesting. What's this? Oh, I don't need this. This is goodbye. I couldn't say anything goodbye to that. Go over here. So this is uh, Space Sheet. And it's basically allowing us to explore these faces. So let's, a couple, let's select a couple fa faces. We're going to do an interpolation. These are synthetic faces generated by um, a neural network that's been trained on a lot of faces. And um, these are actually, each face represents a kind of a point in a multidimensional space that contains a mixture of different face-like properties. So I'll choose a couple that represent really different faces. Maybe um, uh, this woman here, uh, we'll put her there. And then over here, I'll select uh, another person, maybe with a very different face, um, maybe this fella. And if I sort of select these two, it's actually a sort of interactive spreadsheet. If I say create a linear interpolation between them, um, then I can sort of blend between these faces in face space. Um, it gets better. I can I can sort of uh, choose another one. Let's choose uh, her. Let's put her over here. Oops, I just uh, selected the wrong one. Let's put this one back to her as she was, okay. But if I say, let's put her over here, and one more over here, I'll choose um, someone real different. Maybe this fella, okay. Um, I can actually, I believe, interpolate over all of them, and it's a lot like, oh, there we go. It's a lot like those the fruit salad we saw earlier, where sort of creating these kinds of blends. Even more interestingly, we can kind of blend beyond the limits we don't just have to create a kind of a 50-50 mix. We can sort of go further out on this vector uh, from one face to another. So if I choose, uh, let's say, this fella, um, put him there. And if I choose uh, another one, let's say I'll, I'll just put a cell over here with um, who looks relatively different. This person here, this older man. If I then 
not only go here, but also further out even, and say, in this case, lerp as well. I can sort of go further out in that, in that direction, whatever that might mean. It goes, you know, keep further off in the, you know, the difference between them is sort of projected further out. So we have basically a, a spreadsheet for computing with faces. Um, and I, I guess the, the thing to say is that, um, uh, yeah, we, the, 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 the dimensions that are being controlled here are much more than just geometric. They actually represent a very complicated mixture of different properties that govern faces. Let's hop back over to the, the talk. And let's see here, how do I do that? Ah, I go here and hit play, there we go. So um, another project that's involved in interpolation, this is again a new project sort of following on from these interpolation projects from the, from the 60s. This is a project by, Sh by Sarah Schwetman, um, who's a doctoral student at MIT uh, in collaboration with the Metropolitan Museum of Art and uh, Microsoft. And they created something called Gen Studio, which uses neural networks to allow users to creatively navigate the shared features and dimensions underlying 5,000 years of creative production represented in the METS collection. So the user is placed within a map-like model representing the organization of the existing networks, uh, artworks in the MET. And within that model, people can explore a sequence of images that expose them to a host of possibilities. For every object in the MET, the artists who created the system here uh, developed a uh, sorry, identify a corresponding object in the latent space trained on the MET's archive, and then allow you to traverse the latent space between various objects from the collection in order to discover, and this is the best part, artworks that perhaps could have been made but never were. So let's have a look at that. Okay, here's Jen's studio. So um, here we'll begin with uh, some artifacts. I'll pick one that we like. Do we like this urn? Urn, urn will do. Okay, I'll pick the urn and I'll say generate. And it's gonna find a bunch of artic artifacts like that urn. Um, and uh, so now I can kind of move around in this space. And if I go over to that urn, I find an object very much like it, but I can actually create weird blends with other objects from the, mu from the museum. So here I'm, I'm kind of, at, what's interesting here is that it's, it's determining um, uh, properties of urn-like things or armor-like things or even paintings in some cases and sort of identifying um, how objects vary, right? Because if you think about like, you know, Mesopotamian pottery or something like that, it's not, it is, there's variation but there's also sort of consistency. It determines what that consistency is and allows you to sort of invent new vessels that have that consistency as well. So I'm kind of, let's pick it up and let's choose something in between here and here. Or again, beyond. Okay, um, let's head back over to this and continue. <coughs> okay, so one pattern that we've seen so far is this notion of interpolation. All right, we see it in cybernetic serendipity. We see it happening today. We want to see the in-between states of objects, even if it's kind of weird or meaningless or funny. Like, there's a kind of fascination with what it would mean to see a blend of A and B. You know, what if so-and-so and so-and-so had a baby? What would that baby look like? All right, that's, that's the fascination there. There's another fascination that I want to talk about, which we see in cybernetic serendipity, in, com in the history of computer art, and in machine learning-based arts today. And that's this notion of more like this, please, so I'm going to begin with uh, Vera Molnar, um, born 1924 and still working at, ni at 95 years old. She's a Hungarian-French artist who was one of the first 10 people to make art with a computer. Um, and uh, her work also appears in Cybernetic Serendipity. In fact, these projects here uh, are the ones. Um, uh, her pioneering work, um, uh, here you can see four instances of interruptions, a project from 1968. These are generative plotter works. So she would write a program, and these are four different runs of the software. And here's more of her work from 1974. Her work is a particularly good example of how generative computer art has been made for the past half century. Um, the artist writes a program that renders a form. This form is characterized or parameterized by variables designed by the artist. Uh, when she changes the values of these variables, the form changes. So the artist may link these variables to randomness, as Molnar does. Um, or perhaps to gestural inputs, uh, as I sometimes do, um, uh, or to, she may link them to a stream of real-time data or other kinds of data uh, so that the form effectively visualizes data for us. Uh, in, in this case here, um, the artist has created an artwork software that makes artworks prints. And uh, if she wants more like this, please, she just runs the software again. Um, so this is a kind of a good illustration of how computer art has worked for a long time. Um, you know, uh, there's a number that controls, you know, the offset of the squares, 
uh, or you know, how, how angular or how, how misaligned they are, some number that she's put in there to control that. In the age of neural networks, things change. Um, we're going to save a lecture about the wonderful history of early generative computer art for another time. I know that uh, Yasha Reichart, who organized Cybernetic Serendipity, was just here a few years ago, and it's fascinating how the history of computer art coincides with the history of the Exploratorium. Uh, it's 50 years of, of tremendous change. Uh, but what I want to do right now is skip forward to the present day uh, and discuss how neural networks change things in the arts. Uh, in one way of working, the artist working with neural networks does not specify the rules. There's no longer some number that controls the offset of the different squares. Uh, instead, she specifies inputs and outputs and allows the network to learn the rules that characterize that transformation, whatever those rules may be. And those rules are kind of a black box that only the computer understands. So for example, the network uh, might study the relationship between color and grayscale images uh, or versions of an image, right? Uh, or it may study the, the, the relationship between sharp and blurry versions of an image. And then by studying these relationships, um, uh, it, it learns the rules that allow you to sort of say like, how can I get from a, a color image to a grayscale one? And then weirdly, it allows you to run these rules backwards. So that if I had a, a grayscale image, perhaps an old black and white image from the 1920s, I could colorize it automatically. And when it produces the colors that colorize an old, an old black and white image, or when it sharpens an old blurry image into a, one that's sharpened, of course it has to invent information from somewhere, right? The, the grayscale image does not contain color information. The blurry image does not contain sharp information. But um, when they realistically colorize these things or invent these kinds of, of, of properties, they're doing so um, using inferences from thousands or even millions of examples. So it's a best guess as to how it might be colorized uh, based on having looked at millions of examples like this. So that's, that's where neural networks get really weird, is that we can sort of run, we can figure out the rules that between these pairs and then run those rules backwards. So I'm going to show you a really good example of this. Uh, and something fun you can experiment with here and at home. Uh, it's a program called Edges to Cats. How many of you have played with this? Oh, almost no one. Okay, great, a couple of people. This is good. It went, it went viral on my network a couple, couple, like a couple years ago. Uh, it's by Christopher Hess, and it's based on an architecture called Pix to Pix uh, by a researcher named Isola. And in this project, um, Hess took a large number of images of cats, and he ran these through an edge detector. Okay, which is a really standard, it's like it's in Photoshop, it's a very standard kind of image transformation where we take a picture of a cat, we find its edges, and we, this is the result of an edge detected version of that cat, right? Like we get, we get these lines that indicate kind of a very simple image processing, you know, these are where the images, the, the edges are in that, in that image. This is not a machine learning technique, you know, this is, this is, as they say, this is not AI, it's just engineering now. It's just a very simple way of sort of finding the greatest changes in pixels in the image, calling that an edge. What's weird is that we can run that backwards, right? So um, he trained this network to understand the relationship between these image pairs, and then he created an interaction where you can run this relationship backwards by drawing lines and getting cats that fit those lines. So let's, let's uh, just see. Um, so here's kind of some of the things people, people get with it, right? Um, so if you draw a cat, you get a cat, but, but you can draw other things. Right, you can see why this might go viral. Um, uh, and this, in my opinion, as, as you'll see, this is some of the finest interactive art I've ever seen. <coughs> and I'm going to go out on a limb, and I'm going to call Edges to Cats, I'm, I'm actually going to call it a masterpiece. But notice here that none of the actual outputs created by the participants is a masterpiece, right? These are throwaway, these are ephemeral, right? Rather, the masterpiece, if there is one here, is the sort of open-ended system and the way that it operates in culture and give, you know, ways that the ways that it went viral and gives meaning and value and joy, however briefly, to people's lives. Let's get a little joy right now and go try it out. Here's edges to cats. And I'm, gonna, I'm just going to draw, maybe I'll start with drawing some eyes on this cat. I'm just going to kind of put, put some eyes in there. And I'll hit process and I'll see what I get just if I, if I do that. Running. OK, I get some eyes. All right, that's a start. Let's just clear this and just try some, try some stuff. So if I kind of draw. I'm, I'm literally just winging it here. I'm just drawing whatever. Maybe I'll give it some ears. And it needs eyes, of course, because it's a cat. So I'm going to put some eyes on it. Um, I haven't tried this drawing before, but uh, give me what you got. And here we go. OK, so um, you can try this yourself. Uh, <laughs> and you can keep modifying it as well. 
um, and just kind of keep kind of inventing cats as people have done. Um, so to me, this is this really interesting way of understanding how neural nets work. By once having this, this, this relationship between you know, an image and the lines that characterize it, going from lines back to that image becomes something that these machines can do. OK, uh, let's head back to the talk. Um, it may be worth pointing out that the evil twin of Edges to Cast is a project like this one, which is, you know, this is the surveillance tech. This is aimed at capturing the sort of holy grail of, of the surveillance state, which is, you know, occluded or disguised face recognition. Right, so these researchers have trained the network on pairs of images, just like all the other pairs I talked about. In this case, the pair is a picture of your face and a picture of your face wearing a beard, you know, uh, or a picture of your face wearing a hat, and in the hope of running that network backwards, so that if it sees you wearing a hat or sunglasses or a beard, that it can then figure out who you were or what you would look like without the hat, beard, or, or glasses. I don't want to dwell on the surveillance technology, but like, like it or not, the funders of technology like this are the ones who are enabling and making a lot of interesting art possible. Um, so what's interesting about the use of machine learning in the arts is that artists are still writing programs that render a form. This form is still characterized or parameterized by variables, but the difference is that these variables are no longer designed by the artist. Instead, the variables are now deduced indirectly from the training data that the artist provides. And what's especially interesting is, is, is that these variables control perceptually higher order properties. Right? The artist's job becomes one of selecting or creating training sets and deftly controlling the values that, uh, that uh, that, that control the neural network's variables. So this is work um, by Helena Sarin. Um, and so she's basically gone out into her backyard, collected a bunch of leaves, and she's trained a generative adversarial neural network on these leaves and then says, generate some more, please. Um, so uh, I think the way that, that you know, it's important to sort of say how a, a network like this works is that there's actually two f pieces of software that are fighting. There's one piece of software which looks at a lot of leaves and then tries to synthesize a new leaf the best it can based on what it's seen. That's called the generator. And then the adversarial one is this one that sort of looks at the results and says, nah, I don't think that's a leaf. Or, yeah, you fooled me, that's a leaf. And these two things battle it out. Uh, and if it says no, then the one that generates it has to go back to the drawing board. So the two pieces of software are fighting with each other until finally it gets so good that you can generate these sort of weird demented leaves from a planet that, that we don't know about. You know, they even have sometimes two stems, right? Um, uh, another project, uh, speaking of fall collections, uh, where Helena Sarin has been training networks with collections of leaves, uh, a young guy named Robbie Barrett has been uh, training them with fashion lines from Balenciaga. So he's a young artist, he's actually still a teenager, uh, who's been using a corpus of images from the fashion house Balenciaga, uh, their runway shows and you know, catalogs, to generate outfits which are novel but at the same time heavily inspired by Balenciaga's recent fashion lines. Uh, he points out that his network lacks any contextual awareness of the non-visual functions of fashion. You know, why people carry bags, why people prefer symmetrical outfits. And it thus produces really strange outfits that completely disregard these functions, such as a pair of pants with a wraparound bag um, <laughs> attached to the shin, or a multi-component asymmetrical coat uh, with an enormous blue sleeve. Mm. And, you know, I say, you know, these are produced by the mind of the computer. This is the computer sort of like having learned um, what it can as much as it can about fashion, but sort of not getting it quite right. And um, the value that this serves for us is in sort of giving us things we might not have thought of ourselves, the kind of a way of sort of like, like again, defamiliarizing collections like Leaves or collections like Balenciaga um, to kind of allow us to see them anew. Um, the more consistent the idiom that we're studying, the better the principle of more like this, please, uh, operates with neural networks. Uh, Pinar Yanar Dag, she's a doctoral associate at uh, MIT Media Lab, created a project to generate graffiti-like designs. On the left, the things that were in the training set, and on the right, the sort of designs that were dreamed up by her AI. She even engaged uh, a graffiti artist named Sobek to actually execute one of these. So this is Sobek's attempt to kind of like put onto a wall uh, a design that was created by an AI. And it's this is where we sort of say, like, is the machine, you know, does it have this weird mind, or is it the artist who's controlling the machine uh, um, that's actually sort of in control in a weird way? And, and this sort of proves it, I think. This is some a bit of research by Janelle Shane. Uh, she's an artist and AI researcher. Um, and she points out that when training sets are too small, the synthesized results can show the biases that reveal the limits to the data on which it was trained. Uh, for example, here are results from a network that was trained, that she trained that re synthesizes realistic cats, 
And it doesn't do a pretty bad job, actually. It, it makes some pretty realistic cats. But many of the cat images in the training data set were taken from online memes. And so when it, it synthesizes new cats, there are these kind of like weird meme-like things stuck in there, right? These are these, these are these things that, you know, I just asked for a cat, but it, why did it put these letters at the top and bottom? Because the data was in there, right? It, it's not just producing a cat, it's producing what it's seen before, and it thinks that a part of a cat is the text at top and bottom. That's what it, that's what it thinks a cat is. Likewise, um, th there are some images of cats, not all, but some images of cats that have people in them, as you might expect. Um, but this network doesn't have enough images of people to actually synthesize one very well. So when it synthesizes a cat that has a person in there, um, it just does its best guess. And it produces you know, a nice looking cat and then this thing. Right, this kind of mushy situation over here, over there, which is like, that's its best guess as to what a person looks like because it doesn't just have enough examples to work from. Um, uh, she points out that cats in particular are also really highly variable things, just as subjects. And so therefore it's very it's unlikely that a training data set could capture all that variability, for which reason you know, other misinterpretations show up as well. Right? There's just, it, does, it doesn't have a data set that's big enough that it could know that that's wrong. Um, so, there you go. So, the internet is a big and wild and woolly place. Detecting pornography is a major challenge for internet hosts and providers. And to help, um, Yahoo released an open source classifier called OpenNSFW a few years ago, which rates images from zero to one uh, as to whether or not they are porn. And Gabriel Go, a PhD student at UC Davis, wanted to understand this tool better and what, what made it up. So he started by using a neural network to synthesize some natural looking images, which you can see down below, um, starting from white noise, using white noise as a starting point. And he used a generative adversarial network to, to maximally activate certain neurons of the Yahoo classifier, what he called neural net guided gradient descent. And this program basically asked in many iterative steps, how would this image need to change if it were look slightly more like porn? Okay. Like, what would you need to do to make it look more like pornography? In, in a very small increment. Maybe you'd have to make it a little bit more pink or something like that. Who knows, right? And after running this process many, many, many times, he produced these images. It's kind of a remarkable study in the abstract depiction of nudity. <coughs> in short, his machine makes images that another machine believes are porno, right? These images are clearly not safe for work, <laughs> right? You wouldn't want these on your screen when your boss came by. You know, but it's difficult or humorous, perhaps, to say why. Right? From the standpoint of conceptual art, this is really extraordinary. Um, and uh, not only is it possible to synthesize images which maximally activate the porn-detecting neurons, but it's also possible to generate images whose activation span two networks. So he bred these images to be recognized here as beach uh, scenes by a network called Places CNN. Okay? So Places says, oh yeah, th that, those are beaches. So what happens if we get images that both <coughs> uh, are classified as beaches by Places CNN and also as porn by Open NSFW. You end up with the images on the bottom here. Um, so he explains that these images fascinate him because they are only seemingly innocent. Right? The NSFW elements are all present, but just hidden in plain sight. Once you see the sort of true nature of these images, something clicks and it becomes impossible to unsee. Um, if the adult nature of his images are hidden in plain sight, then an interesting contrast is Tom White's synthetic abstraction series, which are seemingly innocent images uh, generated from simple lines and shapes which trick algorithms into being classified as something else. Is that going there? Yeah, it should be. Um, so on the left is an arrangement which fools six widely used classifiers into being perceived as a hammerhead shark or as an iron. And on the right is a silkscreen print entitled Mustard Dream, which he explains is flagged as explicit nudity by Amazon Web Services, Racy by Google Safe Search, and NSFW by Yahoo. Okay? This is work which is by AI for AI, and it helps us see the world through the eyes of a machine. Tom, Wh Tom White writes, my artwork investigates the algorithmic gaze, how machines see, know, and articulate the world. As machine perception becomes more pervasive in our daily lives, the world as seen by computers becomes our dominant reality. So this print on the right hand side literally cannot be shown on the internet. If you were to post that to Twitter or Facebook, you'd be censored. If you were to take a selfie in a gallery with that behind you, you might get banned from you know, Instagram. So it's, it's an image which, which, as innocent as it looks, looks like hardcore porn to an algorithm. 
to several different algorithms, too. Um, so I'm not sure how many of you have seen this website. It just came up a couple days ago called thispersondoesnotexist.com. But uh, this person does not exist. This is a face which is completely generated by a generative adversarial network. If you want to begin to understand that, take a look behind her and answer me, like, where is that or what is that <laughs> behind her? <coughs> Here's another example of a face generated that way. Um, this is also from the same website, thispersondoesnotexist.com. And sort of the same problem that was happening in Janelle Shane's cats is happening here with the microphone. Some images in the training data set contain a microphone, but not enough to really get a good bead on what a microphone looks like. So what we think is that it doesn't, this machine does not understand that there's a microphone there. It understands that some people have this kind of dark thing <laughs> in front of their face, and you know, it doesn't really have a good idea about what that looks like, so it does its best. Um, and uh, someone else is actually using this now to do sort of hot or not uh, sort of type, type things, where you sort of say, like, I think this person's hot or not. Look at this lovely example. Like, she's not bad looking, but I don't know what that thing is to the, her right. <laughs> like, <laughs> Let's, um, let's have a, a, quick, a quick dip over in, in, uh, into um, uh, thispersondoesnotexist.com uh, and just kind of, kind of drop the needle a few times and see what it produces. Uh, so here it is. Uh, this person does not exist. Um, I'm just going to refresh the page. And every time I refresh it, I get another person who does not exist. These are amazing. This is state-of-the-art stuff, but these people do not exist. These are absolutely fake people. Yes, sir? I do not know um, uh, the answer to that. Uh, it is possible to do this in the browser um, pretty fast. Uh, I, I, given the amount of time it takes me between the time I click and the time you get a new one, uh, it might be being generated in the browser. Um, it's possible. It's possible. Yeah. Um, uh, these are truly remarkable, though. And the, some of the things that they're getting right, I mean, the, it used to be that uh, until maybe this, this field's changing very quickly. Until six months ago, you could tell it was a synthetic face because the eyes would be different, or maybe the earrings would be different from each other. And now it's the, the clues are really almost in the background, where it's like you don't know what these backgrounds are because it just doesn't have a good enough idea. <laughs> yeah, there's some weird stuff in there. Yeah. OK, so that's, that's uh, this person does not exist.com. Let's uh, hop back over to here. <coughs> um, this brings us to Ganbreeder, uh, an app which is going to ruin the rest of your week. Uh, and we have it up here on display. It's created by a former student of mine, Joel Simon, who's now an independent artist researcher. And um, uh, it's basically, uh, you get to play with a generative adversarial network and breed images. Um, you can, let's just take a look. We'll jump over to it. Uh, heading over to here. Here's Gambreeder. Um, I'll make this quick, but you can basically, you can pick a thing. Uh, like this, and I can sort of make some children from it. Um, <laughs> so I just make some variations. Uh, and if I want to have them more similar to each other, I can kind of take it this way. And then they're more similar. If I want to make them more different, uh, I can do that and kind of make it more different. And whatever this item is, if we want to look at what its genes are, um, it's made of a mixture of different categories. In this case, a barn spider, uh, an English foxhound, a hard disk, a Model T Ford, and a hot dog. Um, <laughs> So if we would like it to be more hot dog, um, we can add hot dog and maybe less English foxhound. Um, I'm not sure what a tusker is, but I want less of it. And I'm going <laughs> to make child. And then here it is. It's clearly more hot dog. OK. Um, you're going to have a lot of fun. And there's also a Twitter bot uh, where the people sort of publish uh, great, great results of, of this thing. Highly recommended fun. Um, so you can, you can uh, have a good time with this. I want to also point out um, that uh, it actually is, uh, you know, I've been showing you visual examples. I'm primarily a visual artist. But you can actually do this kind of stuff with words as well. Uh, Janelle Shane, who did the, the, cat, the, can, the, the cat experiment I showed you earlier, uh, has done a well-known experiment generating paint color names. <coughs> so you remember I, I showed you, like, you could have, uh, you know, that the pairs of things, the rules we want to learn, right? It could have a color image of a bird and a grayscale image of a bird and learn how to make colored or grayscale images of things. What she's done is the pairs and the rules that she's learned are between colors and the kinds of names you find in like J. Crew catalogs or like paint catalogs for, you know, like, you know, Home Depot or whatever for, for paint colors. So some of the, my favorite examples here are um, Burf Pink, <laughs> Herky White, Rose Hork. All right, not bad. Snader, Snader Brown, okay. Right. 
it's brown. Um, horrible gray. These are just these kinds of names. So I, I highly recommend this project by, by Janelle Shane, um, looking at sort of paint color names. Clardic Flug is up at the top there. Snowbonk. All right. Raunching Blue. Actually, not that blue, but OK. Yeah, that's good. Really, really lots of fun to discover in here. All right, I'm going to wrap up by showing one last project of mine uh, uh, in, called, called Terra Pattern, in which um, it's again kind of uh, based on this theme or this kind of topic of like more like this, please. But rather than synthesizing new things, it's based on the premise that there's enough in the world already, so we just have to find it. Um, and it's a project I made with some friends and collaborators and students, uh, shown here, and with support from the Knight Foundation. And just a little story about how it came about. <coughs> I learned, interestingly, that cows, on average, face north. And um, I, I, didn't, I didn't know this, uh, but it was discovered uh, by a, a German uh, zoologist named Sabina Begal. And she discovered that um, cows, on average, face north. And she discovered this um, with uh, computer vision based on satellite imagery. And basically, she looked at uh, thousands and thousands of images of cows as seen from space. And on average, they face north. So these are sort of the orientations of cows. And as you can see, there's kind of a, a peak sort of facing sort of mag magnetic north. Um, and this is evidence from satellite imagery of a previously unknown, undetected sort of um, uh, magnetic sensibility in ruminants. Uh, it's fascinating. And I, I saw this, and I was like, God, I was really jealous. I was like, man, wish I'd thought of that. Uh, and I, I had developed some expertise in computer vision. And I was like, I want to make similar discoveries, too. Um, and so I wondered what kinds of ways in which we could discover similar kinds of previously undetected things with um, satellite imagery and hopefully machine learning. Um, Dr. Begal did her work with a kind of a custom cow detector. But what if one could make a detector that could detect anything, right? Um, now, it turns out that uh, satellite imagery uh, has always been controlled by a select few. Uh, it's the exclusive domain of, you know, or previously the exclusive domain of the sort of military surveillance. Uh, but recently, it's become increasingly heavily corporatized. Uh, at the forefront of this shift are companies like Orbital Insight uh, that apply machine learning algorithms to satellite imagery in order to sell actionable intelligence to hedge funds <coughs> and other market speculators. And they do this by examining, let's say, the shadows uh, on the interiors of these oil tanks uh, with floating lids. And uh, by looking at these, uh, you can know that there's less oil in this one and more oil in this one uh, because the lid has sort of sunk down. Right, so they can use this by, by finding all these uh, oil tanks. They can estimate the oil reserves of a region, which is information that they can then sell. Another company, uh, RS Metrics, cre creates the US Retail Traffic Index. They look at how many cars are in uh, the parking lots of big box stores. Uh, and they count them up, and they estimate the performance of those stores based on the number of cars in the parking lots. And then they then sell that information to hedge funds in advance of the quarterly reports of those big box stores. Um, as a kind of, uh, as a sort of to goose a few extra, you know, million dollars out of the system. So with uh, enormous amounts of money to be made in the trade of such information products, this type of understanding about uh, the forces shaping our world remains very far from being a public good. And I wondered, you know, what if there were an orbital insight for the rest of us, and for, for artists, for citizen scientists, for curious people? And so I created a project called Terra Pattern, uh, which is an open source tool for finding more like this, please, in satellite imagery. Uh, and it helps sort of the public, pe everyday people, find patterns of interest to democratize geospatial intelligence. And in particular, the world is already pretty well mapped. But the project that I made is ideal for finding sort of non-building structures and other forms of otherwise unremarkable soft infrastructure that are not otherwise usually indicated on maps. And here's some examples of what it can find. I'll give a quick demo and wrap it up. Uh, this, uh, it can find sort of very fine infrastructure, like these rusting oil tanks in Newark, specifically rusting. It can find transformer stations in Pittsburgh. It can find container yards, uh, cul-de-sacs or cul-de-sac in, in suburbs, uh, crosswalks in San Francisco, maybe these are familiar to you, uh, school bus depots in my county, Allegheny County, golf course sand traps, again, things that are not customarily mapped. Uh, or my, really my favorite, these are derelict nautical wrecks in New York City. So just off the coast of Staten Island and Brooklyn, if you have a, a shitty old boat, you just kind of like, like leave it there. And, and like people are like, ah, F it. And they just kind of like have these like, like rusting boats. So if you find one rusty boat, now you can find more like it. So what is this project? It's a kind of a revelatory artwork, a panoptic perceptron for internet conspiracy theorists, or an absurd tool to lay bare uh, the sort of rhetoric of 20th century formalist analysis and urban planning. Let's give it a shot. Um, I'm gonna, that's a demo, but I think we can go to see the live thing here for a sec.
here's Terra Pattern, and look, here's San Francisco. Um, so just uh, right off the bat, if I click on this parking lot, for example, I'll find other parking lots that look like it, and you'll notice that it's all throughout the sort of Bay Area here. Um, if I type in where we're based over here at the Exploratorium, um, it'll find it in this map or over here. This is our Exploratorium. If I click on our lovely roof, I find, of course, tiles that are similar because there are, you know, other tiles in the map that look like the tile I clicked on, but all these other places that have solar panels like the, like the Exploratoriums as well. And if we just kind of uh, zoom around a little bit, uh, let's see here. Kind of, um, I'm not good enough to kind of navigate to it, but I, 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 I chose a little place I want to show just for a sec, uh, if I can find it. Um, the Palace of Fine Arts. Oh, wait, where, where was I? There's a nice, I like this thing. There's a little feature here that I like. There's a little, I like this item. So there's a little round thing here. And when I click on the little round thing, I'm not sure what that is, but I find all the other round things. So you can, you can sort of see them over here. There's like, I can find the other round things in the area. So uh, I encourage you to play with this. This is also online at terrapattern.com. Um, okay, let's, uh, let's head out of there and take it home over back to us here. All right, um, I have just a kind of a, a quote that I wanted to end with. Oh, that's the video, um, which is from Nick Cave. Uh, and this is from an, uh, literally just a month ago or scarcely a month, less than a month ago. Uh, Nick Cave, if you know, you know, he's, he's um, a truly romantic rock musician. Um, and someone asked him in an interview last month if he ever thought it would be possible for an AI to create a song that um, was as good as Nirvana's, you know, It Smells Like Teen Spirit, <coughs> or that was a good, a good a song that would move people. And his answer is extremely interesting and perhaps unexpected, but I think it's kind of inspirational. So I'm just going to read you a paragraph uh, of what he said in response to this here. It's a fascinating question. He said, this is a quote now from, from Nick Cave. It's perfectly conceivable that AI could produce a song as good as Nirvana's Smells Like Teen Spirit, for example, and that it ticked all the boxes required to make us feel what a song like that should make us feel, in this case, excited and rebellious, let's say. And it's also feasible that AI could produce a song that makes us feel these same feelings, but more intensely than any human songwriter could do. But I don't feel that when we listen to Smells Like Teen Spirit, it is, the only, it is only the song that we are listening to. It feels to me that what we are actually listening to is a withdrawn and alienated young man's journey out of the small American town of Aberdeen, a man, young man who by any measure was a walking bundle of dysfunction and human limitation, a young man who had the temerity to howl his particular pain into a microphone and in doing so, by way of the heavens, reach into the hearts of a generation. We're listening to Beethoven compose the Ninth Symphony while almost totally deaf. We're listening to Prince, that tiny cluster of purple atoms, singing in the pouring rain of the Super Bowl and blowing everyone's minds. We're listening to Nina Simone stuff all her rage and disappointment into the most tender of love songs. We're listening to Paganini continue to play his Stradivarius as the strings snapped. What we are actually listening to is human limitation and the audacity to transcend it. Artificial intelligence for all its unlimited potential simply doesn't have this capacity. How could it? And this is the essence of transcendence. If we have limitless potential, then wit, what is there to transcend? The awe and wonder we feel is in the desperate temerity of the reach not just the outcome. Where is the transcendent splendor in, in unlimited potential? AI would have the capacity to write a good song, but not a great one. It lacks the nerve. So that's, that's, <laughs> <laughs> thanks. That's Nick Cave. I uh, well, thank you so much for your, uh, your attention this evening. Um, there's great art yet to be made, and I hope you'll stay tuned to this field. Thank you so much, everyone. Well, let's hear it for Golan Levin. But we're not done. We're not done. Uh, by now, you uh, well appreciate why we at the Exploratorium are so proud that Golan was one of our esteemed Osher Fellows in 2017. Uh, and I've asked to the stage uh, the director of that Osher Fellow program, none other than my colleague Claire Pillsbury, to engage in some Q&A with Golan. So stay in your seats. Your turn to ask questions uh, will pop up again before the end of the program. Thank you. Claire, take it away. Thank you so much, Golan, you for bet. that fantastic presentation. And I'm going to use my prerogative here and ask just one question before turning it over, because I'm sure a few of you have some questions for Golan. So Golan, um, yeah. I was really interested that you started out with cybernetic serendipity, 
where there were just a fortunate few artists who had access of any kind to computers. Yep. And some of those artists were actually engineers who were experimenting in their free time or off hours. So what would you say about how artists' relationship as a researcher, as using computers, has changed over the last 50 years? Uh, so, so the question is like, you know, like what the relationship of artists to technology as, yeah. as this kind of inaccessible medium. The, I, I met Manfred Moore, he's about 80 years old now, and um, uh, you know, he explained about how when he was looking to use a computer back in the mid-1960s, you know, he had to uh, bang on the door of the, the laboratory and say, I want to use the computer to make art. Got a lot of funny looks from people who were like, this is an important machine for important things. Um, <laughs> You know, and then uh, finally getting access on like a Saturday night at three in the morning when he's you know allowed to use it machine because it's not uh, otherwise used. And obviously things are really different now. You know, we have a computer in my pocket, your pocket, uh, that's way more powerful than anything that that uh, he could have had in 1965. Um, and so, um, to a certain extent, uh, computer art is no longer a thing. I think you know my students actually see themselves as post new media artists. Um, uh, we're all computer artists now. Um, you know, there isn't an artist alive who's not now using a computer in some way or another. Um, uh, at the same time, there still does remain a, t a kind of a technological frontier. There's, there's things that are hard to access. There's neural networks that take a week to train even on the, you know, the largest cluster of supercomputers available and artists who are kind of at that, at that edge. I think that, that as long as um, culture is being shaped by technology, and it constantly is now, especially now, um, there will be people who are trying to understand that and predict um, how culture will be, be shaped by it. I think one thing that characterizes a lot of uh, computer art uh, ever since its inception is the way in which it almost is sort of self-obsolescing. Uh, and um, we see this a lot where an artist will um, try to predict what the future will be like as a kind of a mode of art practice um, by making, by using the computer to explore what's aesthetically possible. And um, you know, 10 years later or 20 years later, it's a Photoshop filter, everyone has access to it, and it ceases to be sort of have the power of an artwork and becomes almost like a part of the daily visual vocabulary of everyday life. Um, so the, the challenge is the same one as it's always been, is you know, not just to explore what's technologically possible, not just a demonstration, but uh, to have a poetic potential as well. Um, and that's, that, that's not going to change, and that hasn't changed. Yeah. 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 True. Thank you. Yeah. You bet. Um, so I know it's I know it's getting late. You want to take one or two questions? And then well, yeah? I think I, there's probably a couple people who are, are burning with questions. So Melissa um, oh is going to help <coughs> with the microphone if anybody has a question or comment that was sparked by the presentation. More of a comment than a question, yeah. uh, referring to like when kids were, would like look at their hands yeah. in that thing. Sure. Thinking about how I know that they've been doing work with phantom limb syndrome. Sure. Fa that by presenting a limb that looks like it's the person's and scratching it, they can actually make some of these phantom limb uh, itches go away. Mm -hmm. I wonder if the kids are doing that because they're seeing it and actually feeling that their hand is doing some of those weird things. I, would, I wouldn't be surprised. I, I mean, I, I, I've actually had some contact with researchers who study phantom limb syndrome who've wanted to use the box to kind of do these kinds of, of studies. Yeah, no, I mean, it, when you see your hand being warped and sort of moving, it's almost impossible to tell that it's not actually happening to your hand. Our bodies are, and our minds rather, sorry, are, are, are really malleable. Um, and there's an exhibit like 10 feet from here, I guess it's the, the bronze hand that, you know, it really feels like it's yours, but it's not. Yeah. Yes, we have not one, but two exhibits where you can feel weird things happen to your hand. <laughs> yeah. um, okay. Other questions? I know it's been a lot of material. Oh. Any thoughts on uh, AI and its manifestation in the physical world, physical realm, uh, spaces and objects? And I uh, think I think we're at on the the verge of a really interesting uh, kind of development right now with robotics. Um, uh, there are there was a there's a fantastic computer graphic video from about 30 years ago by Carl Sims in which he sort of evolves these sort of computer graphic boxes that can kind of learn how to walk. And they, they, these, these little creatures, they're very simple creatures made up of just a few, a few polygons, uh, are able to kind of, over time, evolve and learn how to walk or learn how to swim uh, and learn how to propagate you know, themselves by sort of, sort of seeing which one gets the, which by, by moving, which one is able to move the best and allowing those to kind of sort of evolve 
and become these moving robots. And now that's actually happening in, in the physical realm. People are making physical robots that can learn how to walk. And this is a really interesting thing. In, instead of sort of explicitly saying, okay, to make a machine walk, one has to move this motor and then that motor, you know, by it as a designer, instead we sort of say, okay, robot, here's your motors, figure it out. And you know, the robot sort of like tries to move and measures itself and says, well, that didn't work. I'll try this other thing. That worked better. I'll do more of that. And it, it deduces or infers the rules that would allow it to move with the, you know, the, the um, mechanism you give it. Um, and so as, as faulty or as, as, t as good as that mechanism may be. All right? And so now what we're seeing is we're seeing, we're seeing robots that can learn how to move um, on the terrain you plop them on with the bodies that you give them. Um, and um <coughs> that's very interesting. It, it, it's, it's kind of a really interesting frontier for, for expressive movement of sculptures, for terrifying machines of war, <laughs> you name it. Yeah. I think, I think that, uh, that um, one thing is that those robots are going to move in really organic seeming ways. Again, this kind of notion that I talked about earlier, like they're going to seem to us, because we're going to anthropomorphize them, that they're going to move in, in really animal-like ways. Um, but it's because they're, they're, they're going through some of the same kinds of, you know, animal-like evolutions to, to kind of get to that place where they learn how to walk efficiently. Mm. Yeah. So, I mean, in, th in terms of machine learning in, in the, the, the physical realm, yeah, you're, you're going to see it in, in robots. Th there are these fantastic rooms that, that some people have with like 10 robots all learning how to pick things up. And this is actually some research that's also currently going on. They have like 10, 10 arms and they're just constantly trying to learn how to pick things up. Mm -hmm. And then uh, after, you know, a few months of this, they actually figure out how to pick up different objects. You give it a novel object that's never seen before um, and just based on its shape as observed by a camera, you can sort of say, well, I, if I'm going to pick up the thing, it's probably best if I pick up the skinny thing in the middle of the thing, you know. And so th it's starting to happen as well. Again, could be beautiful or terrifying. Yes, ma'am. You know, it's funny. Um, the the critique of computer art as being sort of cold and rational is fi is literally sixty or fifty or sixty years old. It's it's the very first computer art that there was was um, uh, work that I showed you by by Vera Molnar, for example. Uh, people were like, "Oh, it's so cold. It has no, it's so unfeeling. Uh, there's there's no emotion in it." Um, and uh, this pr this this critique of of art made with a computer uh, is, is persistent. Um, I th I think that that's in the eye of the observer of the observer. I think that um, <coughs> uh, there are rules to be sure in terms of the work and I think we see those rules not just in computer work but in, in work that's off the computer by contemporaries of folks like Vera Molnar and like Saul LeWitt which is this rule based work. Yes, it's sort of super logical and so if that feels unemotional to you then, then that's what, it, it, it's artwork which is exploring you know, the capacities of rule systems to make you know, things that speak to our perception. Um, I. I use a computer to make my work and in the hand project, for example, that I showed you, I don't know if that's uh, a cold and logical work. I think it makes people feel some really visceral things. I've seen people sort of stumble away from that feeling kind of nauseated. <laughs> <laughs> Human capacity, you're concerned that by looking at computer art, that people no, will not, lose not the capacity to experience not, emotion. Not by looking at the art, but by living in an increasingly uh, digital infrastructure. That's impossible. I think it's impossible to answer. I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't possibly tell you. I, 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 think, um, uh, I think we're anesthetized by a lot of things, and, you know, social media being one of them, and I, I don't think that, that computer art is, that necessarily plays into that. You know, we're, we're uh, and I also, I, I, I uh, you know, I don't know. I, 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 you know, yeah, I can't, 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 can't handle that one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, we, we, we live, we, if, we, if, we, if we are immersed in Facebook, you know, I think we, have, we still have all the feels. I think that, that maybe w it's just a challenge that we're not getting quick enough feedback from being with our people in real space uh, that we sort of spin off into weird places. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, there's, there's certainly other problems that come from being with screens all the time or not being proximal to other people all the time. But I think the emotions people feel, you know, when they're, you know, perusing Facebook, full of uh, envy and, and, and other kinds of, of illness are, not, are quite real. Um, so, yeah. yeah. I think we have time for one more question. <coughs> yeah.
think that that's something that can be observed and patternized and then, you know, the way they're learning, the machines are learning what you're showing. Right. W do you think that that can happen with, like, the one that, the thing that I think of computers is that's missing is, like, you know, executive judgment and, and morality and that kind of thought <laughs> about making, and I'm wondering if that's something that can eventually be learned and, and what no, I actually, I actually don't think so, and I think part of the problem that we're in, uh, experiencing now, and this is this is in, in that area of sort of AI and ethics, is is that um, you know these machines are being given more important tasks than ever because they're able to move around in the world and they're able to you know like point you know guns at people or they're able to to do to, to just act in on on our behalf or you know act in the world, and I think that we're we're beginning to ask them to make choices that actually have sort of life and death consequences. And I don't think that the computers can can have that. So, so you know, what we see is that um, the biases in the training data sets, for example, which I think were obvious to everyone here when you see the sort of the memes popping up with the cats and it thinks that the microphone is part of someone's face. You know, those biases are not so obvious sometimes, um, uh, when especially when the data is maybe not not purely visual um, about you know who's a terrorist or who's not or these kinds of things and and. Um, it's actually really, really terrifying. I, I think that, that these things are black boxes. If, if computer art used to be so simple as to sort of say there's one number that controls sort of how much the rectangles are offset, there's a way in which that's a really controlled world, right? We know exactly what the variables are. If instead I've said, you know, um, learn how to generate leaves, you know, what the parameters are are less clear. Um, and uh, it, uh, I think there's th these become black boxes where we know that they've learned some rules, but we don't know what those rules are, and we don't know how those rules have been affected by the data that we happen to have given them and the data that we didn't give them. Mm -hmm. um, so, no, I, I think it you know, executive judgment is going to be a really big challenge. I, I, I don't necessarily, I'm not particularly hopeful, uh, except in the arts, where I think we'll be able to make some really interesting and weird uh, and defamiliarizing and uncanny things. So. Wonderful. Thank you so yeah. much, Gong. Yeah. Thanks to all of you. <laughs> thanks everyone for coming out tonight. I hope this was good for you. Thank you. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming tonight, as mm -hmm. Golan yep. mentioned. And um, let's not let the machines think everything for us. I think that was a good uh, conclusion at the end. Um, I know that some of you will be looking forward to our next Truth or Consequences. And so mark the date. It's April 2nd. with. Aza or Aza Raskin from the Center for Humane Te Technology, and he'll share some of the challenges of how technology is designed to um, command human attention. Um, thank you all for joining us this evening and for su your support of the Exploratorium. It means a lot to us. And if you're able, please stay for dessert and to explore Edges to Cats or again, uh, breeder, breeder yeah, for, for yourself. Sure. They're, they're in batch. They, they've got a couple of laptops with I the know we all were taking down those URLs and getting ready to play. Edges to Cats. Yes. Yeah, Edges to <laughs> Cats is my favorite, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you all for attending tonight. Thanks very much. Yeah.